symbol. Anybody remember that? Why? Why? To hide the message because he was where? And to keep the Roman soldiers from knowing what he was sending out, it has these strange symbols. So practical. Now you're calm about it, but I'm excited about that. That God can be sly. Yeah, God can be sly. And so he, he wrapped the book, Broussard, in these symbols, and the Roman soldiers looked at it and said, well, the old man has lost his mind completely, send it on off the island. But then he gave the keys, I'm trying to stay calm about it, Mike, I don't want to preach last week's sermon again, but he gave the keys to the church, so when the church got the book, they could unfold it. If you could just say amen, make me feel so much better. Yes, genius in this book. And then we learned that the book of Revelation was given to John because, don't forget last week's sermon on this one, the book of Revelation was given to John because by humility and submission, he had become trustworthy to receive the revelation. And we pointed out, Kathy, that if you want to receive, listen to me, if you want to receive a revelation of Christ, about Christ, you must be ready to receive it. What do you say? A spirit a shim of, of, of humility and, and reception. Then God says, well, here's a person. I can, I can now unfold myself, Cecil, fully to Cecil because he's ready to receive me. And keep in mind, and we'll talk about this in my, in my second sermon today, John had to go through a great deal before he was ready to receive the revelation. And you are going to have to go through a great deal more than you've gone through before God can trust you with a full opening of himself to you. What do you say? It's scary. It's scary, Carl, but, but God loves you. He'll, he'll gently lead you in preparing because I don't know about you, I, I, I'd like to experience the fullness of God. The fullness of God. And of course, the Bible says Jesus has the fullness of God himself. So, now the book was written between 95 and 100 A.D. Christ was crucified around 31 A.D. So it's been 70 years since Jesus returned to heaven, and the book is given. In the intervening years, the Christian church has grown rapidly from 120 members in Acts, the first chapter, to tens of thousands by the beginning of the second century. And as we will see when we study the messages of the seven churches, apostasy, what word did I say? Is beginning to creep into the Christian church. False teachings are poisoning the movement. And by the way, let me just slip this in. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be aware in the Seventh-day Adventist church that Satan is beginning to introduce false teachings in our church. And I'm, going to, I'm going to resist the temptation to go off into some of those. I'll simply say to this, more of us in this church need to know for ourselves what this church teaches. Too many of us are too quickly duped by something exciting and interesting and curious. But we... we, 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 we we, we need to know for ourselves the Sabbath truth, don't we? We need to know the key text. Don't we need to know that for ourselves? We need to know what the Bible says about the second coming so we don't get caught up in the secret rapture. We need to know for ourselves. See, I've gone off on it anyhow. We need to know for ourselves about, about the state of the... You know, there, there are Seventh-day Adventists who still think that when somebody dies, they go to heaven? That's not Bible. So false teachings were coming into the church. And the word of God was beginning to be injected, even in the worship, with some of these false teachings. This falseness had been predicted. Let's read some texts. First, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. Let's just look at this. See, what Jesus said, that's what, that's what this sermon is about. And so there were warnings that came, and 2 Thessalonians is a good example. Chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 
Now, brethren, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind. Soon what? They don't be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one do what? And I taught you in a sermon last year that Satan's major method, Jenea, for getting at you. See, he, he can't get at the Seventh-day Adventists with, with, with beer and, and wine and, 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 and unclean meats. We don't do that. <clears throat> we don't do that. <laughs> Somebody help me today. So what he does, he comes to us with deception. See, he fools you. Because you've read the Bible. You, 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 you know the basic teachings or you wouldn't be sitting here this Sabbath morning. You know the basic teachings, but, 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 but he, he deceives. As the Bible says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless... Do you see what's in that text? What's going to happen? What? People are going to start, lose, start leaving the church. Because of false teaching. They won't be rooted. They won't be grounded. They don't have an answer for the hope that's within them. Somebody comes along with a nice voice and a, a scholarly tone and they start presenting something that sounds interesting and you don't have that radar in your head that says, that don't sound right. See, even when I'm preaching, you, there ought to be a radar that says, eh, Pastor, that's a nice guy, but that, that wasn't quite right. Why? Because you know the Bible for yourself. So there was a warning that what Jesus said might be distorted. In fact, 1 Timothy 4, 1, we won't read it, says, some will depart from the faith. And 2 Timothy 4, 4 says, some, watch this one, 2 Timothy 4, 4, says some don't even want to hear the truth. I'm talking about the church now. <laughs> so it's very important for you to see that in the book of Revelation, it, it's not just trying to be verbal or use a lot of verbiage when it says, from Jesus Christ. It's trying to say, this book is from Jesus, and you need to listen to what Jesus said. So in Revelation 1-5, the book is from Jesus. Now, look at Revelation 1-3. Look at Revelation 1-3. Because this is, the, this, is the, this is the setup text for today. Revelation 1, 3. Watch this. All right, you see it? You see it up there? Come on. Let's read it together, everybody. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. And do what? No, you, you don't need to go by the word keep. <laughs> Read, hear, and do what? Keep. Keep. See, if you want to protect yourself, if you want to protect yourself from the errors of mind and belief predicted in Scripture, if you want to protect yourself from that, you must be willing not only to just hear and read, but also to Obedience builds a wall around your soul. Somebody say amen. Yes. That's the problem. That's what weakens you and sets you up to be deceived. You're not doing what you know. Obedience, Anwar, protects the mind. Because as you do it, you experience God's glory. You experience God's strength. So Revelation says... It comes from Jesus, but you got to do more than enjoy it. You must hear, you must read, and then keep what? Those things which are written in it. Why? Read it. Why? 
This is not the time to get weak in obedience. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in the book of Revelation, you see a pattern developing. Look at Revelation 2 and verse 1. Revelation 2 and verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these things says what? He. Who's he? Jesus. Look at verse 8. Revelation 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last. Who's that? Jesus. Revelation uh, uh, 2 and verse 12. You see it? And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things says, who's that? Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. You get the pattern? Each time there's a message given to the church, it comes from Jesus. See, the day's sermon is entitled, What Jesus Said. So, Tony, I want you and your wife to understand, when you read this book, you're getting a word directly from who? Jesus. But before you get the word, Elder Ortega, the Bible says, when you get the word, blessed are those that hear, that read, and that keep. And when Pastor Jeff and I get into the seven churches, you're going to see, Tara, there was, Tara, there was a consistent problem. And the problem was the people of the church, for the seven churches take you through the whole history of the church to the second coming of Jesus. And you're going to see that the problem with the church all through its history has been we know but we do not do. That's a problem. It weakens. It undermines. It dilutes your Christian experience. You know right, don't do right. Now you can follow this pattern all through the rest of the seven churches. It's always Jesus saying. That's why the sermon's entitled, what Je the, the, this book is what Jesus said. And the response to what Jesus says is to read and hear and read and hear and that's it. I want that, I want that to get down in your souls and ask yourself the question after this sermon. I know I read. I know I hear. How am I doing on part three? See, Satan is afraid of people who keep. I gotta take you to the wilderness with Jesus. You remember him, don't you? Hungry, tired, 40 days of fasting. <laughs> Here comes the old devil. And each time the devil came, what did Jesus do? He quoted that word. Come on, somebody. Yeah, let's celebrate him for a few minutes. Jesus, what, he beat the devil upside one side of his head and the other, just quoting scripture. Don't get me started now. Forget what I'm supposed to preach on today. Yes, sir. As a bad brother, you come to me, I got the Bible. You mess with me, I quote a text. You try to discourage me, I got hope in God's Word. Amen. I got to calm down now. I got to preach again today, but I tell you, this thing just gets to me. The Word is full of power. But you got to do more than hear it and read it. It's got to be down inside of you so that in life crisis, that's where Jesus was in the wilderness. The thing, that, the thing that troubled, watch this now, like this one. The thing that trouble squeezes out of you is the word. Not curses, not worrying, not fretting. When trouble comes, you're just so full of the word, the word comes out. Why is this important? 
We read Revelation 1, 3, didn't we? Go to Revelation 22, 14. I'm going to show you something. Don't you forget. If you don't get anything down in your notes today, get this. Get this. The book ends the way it begins. Revelation 1, 3, it said, blessed are those that do what? Read, hear, and do what? Now, look at Revelation 22. Look at Revelation 22 and verse 14. <laughs> you see it? Let's read. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. It begins with keep and it ends with what? Do. <laughs> keep, do. So the book of Revelation is tied together by obedience. And everything in it comes from who? Jesus. I want that to sink in. He begins, keep. He ends, do. Sounds to me like the Bible's trying to teach us that Christianity is no joke. Christianity changes your life. Christianity corrects the way you act. Christianity changes what you talk about. Christianity alters how you treat your fellow man. Come on, somebody. Christianity is not theoretical. It's the everyday practice of the principles of Jesus Christ. Now, human beings have always had a problem. Isaiah 65 is going to tell you what it is. Isaiah 65 and verse 12. We have a problem. The Bible calls us out on this problem. Isaiah 65, what verse did I say? Verse 12. Well, somebody's listening. Ah, ah, see it up there? Come on. Let's read together. Therefore, I will number you for the sword. And you shall not blow down, bow down to the slaughter. Because when I call, let's say another word. When I called, you didn't do what? Read on. When I spoke, you did not, but did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. How much plainer can the Bible be? Dunbar Henry, we have a problem. What's the problem? He calls and we do what? We don't answer. He speaks, we don't hear. You recall when I taught you last week the various ways that God speaks to man. We've mentioned that he speaks to us through sermons. Remember that? Yeah. When Pastor Jeff... Pastor Mario, Pastor Taft, whoever it is, gets up here in this pulpit and preaches the word of God. God is calling. He's looking for a response. And he says the problem with God's people is they don't respond. In fact, Jeremiah 6.10 says, we have uncircumcised ears. Now, there's, a, there, 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 there's a picture for you. You know, circumcision is the cutting away of flesh. God says, your ears are all gummed up. Something needs to be cut away. Jeremiah 12, 2 says, we have rebellious ears. Zechariah 7, 11 says, we have stopped up ears. Acts 28, 26 says, we have ears that hear but don't understand. 2 Timothy 4, 4 says, we have ears that don't want to hear. And Mark 8.18 says, we have ears that just don't work. So the church 
has a hearing problem. And remember, Revelation says, blessed are those that hear, that read. Now we know, Sister Dunbar, now we know that the word hear in the Bible is not talking about the ability to receive sound. Hear has to do with understanding, listening, listening. God wants you to do more than hear. He needs you to listen to what he's saying. And that concept is repeated in Revelation over and over again. Hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. It was very frustrating for Jesus when he was on the earth. Because Jesus basically spent his time dealing with church members, you know. Pharisees and scribes and hypocrites. All those words describe church members. Yeah, yeah. They're always on. The church, you know, the church was always hanging around Jesus. Couldn't get rid of him. Wake up in the morning, there they are. Pharisees, scribes, and hypocrites. He come out of lunchtime, Pharisees, scribes, and hypocrites. Preach a sermon, there they are, sitting on the front row, Pharisees, scribes, and hypocrites. And so in Matthew 12, 3, sometimes Christ would get so frustrated, he would say, have you not read? It's in the Bible six times. It's like me saying to you, you were here last Sabbath? Yeah. Did you listen to anything I say? Yeah, uh, 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 Matthew 19, 4. Have you not read? See, they would ask him dumb questions. And Christ would say, you haven't read anything? I mean, what's with all these Sabbath school qualities stacked up on your, on, your, on, on your shelf? You didn't get nothing? Academy? WAU? <laughs> Revivals? Pastor passing out stuff? You didn't get nothing? One text. Matthew 21, 42, he says, have you never read? Takes to another level. Did you, did, 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 did you ever study? What I'm saying to you, folks, Christ is expecting more from a listening church than he's getting. The book of Revelation is about what Jesus said. And the question is, did you hear did you read? Did you what? Did you keep? He really gets rough on them in Matthew 22, 29. He simply says to the Pharisees, scribes, and hypocrites, he says, you don't know the scriptures. Now, boy, we, we Adventists, we get insulted by that. What? I don't know the what? You don't know the Bible. We take pride in that. We know the Bible. Can I be blunt? Hell's going to be full of people who know the Bible. Can quote it. Yeah. Knowledge that does not alter practice is just information. One of the things I teach in my preaching classes at WAU to the preaching students is sermons are not information. It's the Word of God. And when you stand up to preach joy, you ought to stand up with the confidence that somebody's life is going to be affected. Why? Not because Wright is preaching, but because he's got this powerful book in his mind and in his mouth. And when the Word goes out, it cuts and changes. It's not an ordinary book. And so the words of Jesus open and close the book of Revelation, our final text, Revelation 22. Revelation 22. See, just a little teaching today to set you up for the seven churches, Revelation 22. And let's read what Jesus said as he closes the book. That's his book. Revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation 22. And let's read together verse 7. Revelation 22, verse 7. You see it? Let's read. Come on. Behold, 
I am coming how? Go on. Blessed is he who... Forgive me for enjoying it so much, folk. Now notice, Anwar, he puts keeping in the context of his coming. How's he coming? Therefore do what? Yeah. <laughs> think about how kind God is. I want you to think about the things that happened in 2015 that alerted your mind to the fact that we're near the coming of the Lord. See, I, 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 I consider those personal messages from God. Do you? Yeah. Jesus is tapping him on the shoulder when these people are going around with these bombs and, and attacking unexpectedly and the nations are gathering in the Middle East. God's stage for the end time is the Middle East. Oh, I can't wait to get to Revelation 16 and tell you about that. Everything God, oh, well, calm down, Henry. Everything God has ever done to save humanity, he's done in the Middle East. Don't get me started. I can't leave 10 sermons ahead. <laughs> Everything. That's God saying, behold, I'm coming how? Yeah. Therefore, you ought to do what? Keep. The quick coming, Ken says, ought to keep. Keep on reading. Revelation 22, verse 12. Verse 12, look at that. Here he goes again, come on. And behold. Now, why do you think he says it twice? Huh? That's right, Sonia. He wants you to get it because he knows we have a hearing problem. So we already read those texts. I don't know about you. My mother was, my mother was very strict. Little West Indian sister, didn't play around. When she spoke, that's it. And mom did not like to repeat anything. So if you went on and did what you said don't do, she would come back and say, did you hear what I said? And she'd point like that. Now you, you're doing good as long as she's pointing. Don't let her stop pointing. Because <laughs> all Hades is about to break loose. You praying that she keeps on pointing for the rest of her life. Just point. <laughs> did you hear what I said? And I found myself doing the same thing with my boys. I don't like to repeat stuff. Or I might say, what did daddy just say? So here he is again. Behold, I come quickly. And what? And my what? To give every man what? Now he's saying the keeping. Hey! The keeping is going to pay off. If I just keep what's coming. Reward! Don't be afraid to say it. He closes the book with his word. Look at verse 13. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, beginning of the end, the first and the last. Verse 16, read, come on. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the, in the churches. I am what? I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. This book is for the churches. And then verse 20. <laughs> verse 20, y'all. Verse 20, he's going to say it a third time. Read it, come on. He who testifies to those things saying, Surely, if you didn't get it the first time, Charlene, the second time didn't get you, one more time. Three times you're out. <laughs> one more time. I'm coming. That's why you need to listen to what Jesus says. Do you see it, church? Oh, I love you. Do you see it? So as we journey through this book this year, I want you to hear Jesus talking. Now we're ready to step into those seven churches. And over and over again to every church, he's going to repeat, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Some of you, some of you heard it this week. 
listen to me. You were troubled. You were upset. You were discouraged. You messed up again. And the voice said, listen to me. Hear what Jesus said. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. Just praying. We're just praying. If your ears are stopped up, you're asking the Lord to unstop those ears. If your ears don't like truth, you're asking the Lord to help your ears to be receptive to truth. If you're not diligently searching the scriptures for what Jesus says, you're asking right now in this moment, Lord, help me to look and hunger for your word. But you're talking to Jesus right now to ask him to help you receive what he says to the church. That's your prayer. That's your prayer. Now in the quietness of this moment, if you're sitting in the pew and you can see one of those little yellow cards sticking in the pew, you want prayer or you want to study or you want to make a decision, just take the card right now, quietly fill it out, nobody's business but yours. But in this moment of launching, we're about to open the book and get into its prophecies. You, prom you promised me, Lord. You, you made a promise to me. Blessed are those that hear, that read, and that keep. I can't do any of it without you. I need your help to hear. I need your help to read. And Lord, you know I need your help to keep. Bless us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you enjoy the word today? God be praised.